like uh, we're going to get started. It's a couple minutes after six here. Um, I'm David Jacobs. Just wanted to welcome you all to the webinar. I wanted to firstly thank the people who helped get this set up. Of course, I want to thank our host, Dr. Hogan. Uh, we want to uh, just recognize uh, Adam Bauer, one of the uh, residents on the uh, pediatric section of the residents and fellows section uh, of the uh, SIR, um, and uh, everyone who uh, helped get this going. Uh, I'm David Jacobs. I'm a, uh, currently a second year direct pathway resident at uh, Downstate, SUNY Downstate Hospital in Brooklyn, New York. Um, I uh, came to uh, direct pathway after having done pediatric residency, so obviously I'm uh, strongly interested in pediatric interventional. Um, we have uh, three scheduled PIR lectures. Tonight is the first of them. Tonight we have uh, Dr. Mark Hogan posted, uh, going to be presenting for us. He is the Chief of Vascular and Interventional Radiology at Nationwide Children's Hospital in Columbus, Ohio. He is a clinical professor at Ohio State University. Uh, Dr. Hogan uh, came to uh, Cincinnati through, uh, I'm sorry, Columbus through med school at the University of Cincinnati. He did a residency with a first year in uh, pediatrics, and then he went into radiology at the University Hospital of Cincinnati and did a fellowship in pediatric radiology at the Cincinnati uh, Children's Hospital Medical Center. He is uh, very well published. He has numerous articles and publications ranging from radiology to pediatric pulmonology, which I'm sure you all read on a regular basis. Uh, and uh, he's going to be giving us a what I'm sure is going to be a very interesting talk in pediatric interventional uh, chest. So, uh, Dr. Hogan, I thank you very much for joining us, and I thank, for, thank you for agreeing to uh, give this uh, presentation. Uh, there's going to be a uh, few moments for questions at the end, so if anybody has any questions, uh, you can uh, send them to me by text. You can chat, uh, right-click on my name and hit chat, and uh, I'll record your message, your questions and uh, ask them to Dr. Hogan at the end so we can keep a uh, good order going. Um, Dr. Hogan, thanks for, thanks very much. Take it away. All right. Thanks for having me. If anyone has a problem hearing or something, let me know, um, and we'll try to fix that. All right. So first we're going to talk about pleural disease in the chest, and that, that's most of the stuff we do in chest interventions is with pleural disease. Now, we're going to be basically talking about body interventions in this talk and not vascular interventions. That's a separate talk that I have, but we're not going to be covering those here. Um, but as you know, in the pleura, you can have fluid, air, blood, fibrosis, plaques, tumor. You can have many different things in the pleura and, and all kinds of different pleural disease. We're going to focus on perineumonic fluid collections. And by pneumonia, we usually mean streptococcal pneumonia. That's the most common type we see in kids. And, and actually, the incidence of strep pneumonia causing empyemas and abscesses is increasing. And that may be due to serotype conversion, or it could be due to um, resistance from the pneumococcal vaccine. Um, but both in the U.K. and U.S., that's becoming much more common. Uh, we used to think of staph as being, that's always taught of as being the thing that gives you abscesses and empyemas and everything, but it's actually much less common. And then you have other things such as homophilus and strep variants and so forth, and then you have the patients who aspirate, so those are other causes as well. But really, it's strep pneumonia. So when you have fluid and you have pleural disease, it can be simple. It can be an effusion, which is serosanguinous or a transidate, and then it evolves into an empyema, which is called an exudate. And there's all these terms. I'm going to go a little bit more in depth on them, and then I'm going to tell you why it doesn't really matter later as well. Um, so then you get some pleural thickening, or you can end up with a pl uh, pleural rind or a peel. In our archaic thought, this is what a lot of surgeons still think, is that the fluid starts real thin. And then over time, somehow, this fluid becomes viscous, and then later it becomes fibrous and solid. And that's when you talk to a surgeon, they want to put a huge tube in. That's the argument they see is that the fluid's too thick. Well, it's not too thick. Uh, that's an archaic thought. Uh, this is a staging based on light criteria. Uh, it's very complicated. There's all these different things, and there's been different ways of looking at it. Um, but basically, early they say it's thin, then it becomes purulent and fibrous, and then it becomes a peel over time. And my computer, oh, there we go. Um, but the question is, does it matter? Because it doesn't determine therapy, and it's not specific for outcome. So really, it doesn't matter at all is the bottom line. Uh, to show an example, we have two patients here. We have patient one who has a low pH, low glucose, high LDH, and high white blood cell count. So that looks really bad. Whereas the second patient has good pH, good glucose, and looks much better. And then if we look at ultrasounds from these two patients, we have this here where it's echogenic, but there are no loculations or anything. So this will come out very easily with a tube. Whereas this patient has all kinds of loculations. You see you put a tube in here, and nothing's going to come out. And this is the patient with the bad lab bias because this is pus in the pleural space. 
and this patient has a good lab values, but it's pretty easy to tell that this is going to be much more difficult to drain than this. So the real truth is that the fluid starts out thin, and it can become thick with infection, but more likely what we see are septations and loculations that occur, and then you get these pockets of thin, serous fluid which are walled off from each other by the fibrous tissue. And eventually you'll have fibrosis, which can lead to a trapped lung. So that's what we want to avoid. So the traditional approach to treating these patients is to give them IV antibiotics. And in imaging, they used to do these decubitus films, which I hope I never see another one of them again for this cause, because it's actually pretty worthless. And it was thought to be a surgical disease. They put huge tubes in, and when they failed, they'd do a thoracotomy and do a decortication. So it was a big thing and uh, not very pleasant for the patient. So they did some improvement in the management, and they started using fibrinolytics, and we're going to talk a lot about that later. Uh, then they created VAS, which is short for Video Assisted Thoracoscopic Surgery, and it's a way of using a scope, and they found that it gives a shorter hospital stay, and it's less invasive than a decortication. But VAS, all VAS are the same. Some people use a small scope, others basically make an incision and put their finger in there and do a minor decortication. So, you know, just the term VAS doesn't mean exactly the same thing every time. Um, started using CT imaging, which was good because you saw both the pleural and the parenchymal disease, and they used to always get it all the time, and uh, I don't think that should be done anymore, and I'll explain that later as well. And then when all those things failed and everything was bad, we would do image-guided bailout. And this is the first patient I ever did. And uh, you can see they had this big pneumonia here, big effusion, got the CT scan. We can see uh, the effusion out here, the empyema. We can see some straining of the lung, goes along with some scarring and some loculations. And then this patient went for VATS. And afterwards, you can see this huge tube in a small chest. But here's this huge collection up here that's still here and has air in it. Um, so this patient was not doing well post-op. And so they brought it to us. You can see why it doesn't drain, because there's all these loculations through it here. In image guide, we put a pigtail catheter in. We started TPA. We cleared the pleural space. And here was the patient later. So all the tubes are out. And there's some, you know, there's some pleural thickening and stuff left over, uh, scarring that will you know, evolve over time, um, the patient's off oxygen is doing much better right now. So, so that's sort of how we got into this. And now, I tell you now, we do every single patient. So no one touches these patients but us anymore. Um, so how did that evolve? Well, the IID docs, most of these patients were on the infectious disease service. They saw that when the surgeons failed, we did it. But our procedure was easier, was just as successful, and we were more responsible. So when they called, the surgeons would be like, yeah, I'll get to it in a day or two, and we'd be like, when can you get the patient down? Um, so by doing all that, we got the patients, and they saw how well it worked, and so we actually took it over. But the surgeons thought we were wrong. They didn't think this was going to work. They thought we were crazy. Um, but they weren't. So we did a chest X-ray with a fusion here. You can see the fusion at the site. We put a needle into it, drain. The patient comes back and looks better. So it works very well. Now, unfortunately, most of the imaging for these looks exactly the same, so it's sort of boring from the imaging. Okay. Um, so our first year experience, the surgeons all of a sudden thought it was great, and so they, they said everyone needs to see that we should do this. So working together with pediatric surgeons and surgery and cardiothoracic surgery and us, of course, uh, we actually did a retrospective review and looked at our data. Um, so we had about two years' worth, and there were 54 patients who came in with empyema. Of those, only 42 had went to IR. So some of them just went to surgery ahead of time. Again, this was retrospective. It wasn't a, a, a prospective study where everyone was uh, sent for, for tubes. And it wasn't really standardized because we were sort of learning our way. Um, so tube size, doses, all that kind of stuff wasn't really standardized in the beginning with. But what we found was that of all the patients with empyema, 79, so basically 80% of those patients, were treated totally with tube and or TPA. But of the patients we actually got, that actually had our tubes, we had a 90% success rate of treating them. Um, so that was pretty good. It wasn't as good as it is now because we've done some different things that I'll talk about, um, but it looked pretty good. Um, again, same kind of patient has pneumonia, develops a fusion, empyema on the side, get a CT scan. We always did at those times. Uh, so we had the fluid here. We put a chest tube in. It's gone away, and the patient got better. So then we looked at why did we have the failures? Well, for a variety of reasons. First of all is that um, we didn't start the fibrinolytics sometimes right away. Uh, and so the patients would get a big fibrous peel and so forth before we could get started, so that failed. Or we started fibrinolytics, but it, so we thought it worked, so we quit, and then they had more fluid, and, and they were a failure as well. Uh, sometimes the referring docs, we drain them, and they'd still be febrile a day or two later, which is normal because they got this terrible pneumonia. 
Um, but, you know, if they weren't afebrile within, like, 24 hours, they were trying to send these patients to the operating room because they thought it wasn't working, which wasn't true either. Um, but some of them thought that way. And, and occasionally we'll get a bronchopleural fistula as well. We had one in that case. And you see this patient here. This is necrotic lung. It doesn't enhance as well as the rest of the lung. We can't even see the pleural edge in some places. Uh, we see this again, sort of pus in the pleural space. We have the lung here, maybe even some little micro abscesses at this site. Um, so we drained it, and that looked really good. So that was doing well. Um, but then the patient later, you can see now that necrotic lung is sort of basically rotting and falling apart. And here's our tube and this big air containing thing, cause, and the patient had a bronchopleural fistula. Um, we can treat almost all our bronchopleural fistulas, and I'll talk about that later as well. Um, but occasionally you can't, and they may need a VATS procedure. Now, VATS actually has a much higher incidence of VP fistulas than our technique does. So that's not something that's unique to image-guided drainage. So what about lessons learned? Well, lab tests, we said, are worthless, except for culture. If they don't know what the bug is, uh, then they can help with that. Although, again, it's almost always strep pneumonia. What about image? We'll talk about some imaging things we've learned, some things about the procedures, and then the follow-up that we do as well. So what about CT? Well, it's really good for looking at the parenchyma. It shows the pneumonia, the extent of it, any necrotization or abscess. In pleural disease, it shows that it's there, um, but its characterization is very poor. It doesn't really tell you how many loculations and stuff are in there. So it does give incomplete prognostic information. I do not believe CT is necessary to start treatment. Uh, you do not need a CT scan to see all the lung stuff before you put a tube in and start treating for the empyema. And so we actually discourage the use of the routine CT. Again, one of the big reasons is because of radiation dose to our patients. Uh, although the referring physicians do sort of like it, it makes them feel happy, and so sometimes they get it anyway. Um, but here's a bunch of CT scans. You can see the lung here is, you know, a little peaked and stuff, so we can think they're loculations, but we can't know for sure. I showed you this with the necrotic lung, and that was actually pretty thin, or it was thick fluid, but it didn't have loculations. And then, obviously, this one has a lot of loculations at this site. So, again, it shows a lot about the lung, but the shows it's a pleural fluid or not, but not necessarily that great. But here's when CT is awesome. So this patient here had a big pneumonia, had a CT that showed the diffusion, and had some necrotization up here. Okay, so we put a chest tube in. You see the tubes here. The pleural space is evacuated. So we did a great job of treating the pleural space. But this patient was febrile and was doing poorly. So the repeat CT scan showed this again. This collection up here. This was an abscess, and so we put a drain into that, drained the abscess out, and the patient got better. So the CT scan showed us why the patient wasn't doing better, and this is really the best rule for CT. So again, not initially necessary, does give some good information, but really valuable for a non-improving patient to exclude an abscess. So if you think there may be an abscess, that's where CT is great. What about ultrasound? Well, it stages the fluid. There's three stages, one, two, and three, but the bottom line is on the column are stage two. Um, and it has to do with how many septations there are. Stage one, we usually don't do anything with these patients because it's simple fluid. Um, you could probably maybe just tap them, but one of the problems is is that when you tap a patient, t a kid, you typically sedate them. And if you're going to be tapping them every two days or so, you don't really want to do a new sedated procedure every couple days. And so for those patients, we usually just put a chest tube in if they need something done. Um, stage two, again, is by far the most common, although there can be a few septations or there can be a ton of septations. Uh, so the stage two is, has a huge variation. All those patients need TPA to break up the, the loculation. Well, I should say fibrinolytics. We use TPA, and I'll, I'll go over that also. Stage three, that looks like a solid pleural peel, and what's really amazing is you think none of these patients would respond, but you put a tube in and use fibrinolytics, and the vast majority of these will go away. Um, so it melts it down. So here's a patient. You can see the chest x-ray here. has pneumonia down the left lower lobe. has what looks like some pleural disease. My colleagues in diagnostics said it had pleural disease, but then when we do imaging, there's really no pleural fluid here, so there was nothing to do. So this patient was sent to us for drainage, and we did the ultrasound, and we said there's nothing to do. Here's a patient who had pneumonia. We tapped it. You can see just going right in. and came back, had more fluid, looked again with ultrasound, had more fluid, and ended up putting a chest tube in. So this is what we try to avoid is having to do multiple sedated procedures on a patient. But uh, unfortunately, this patient's effusion came back. And these are some different ultrasound images of uh, different pleural collections. We see this one's fairly clean. This is one that's echogenic as a pus. We can see some septations here. And then you start getting this Swiss cheese look. Now, this is still a grade two, um, but really they can 
look pretty, pretty uh, solid over time. Another patient here, you can see this is a scalp from from a CT. Airways pushed over, big mass effect. And we see here is a CT, big fluid, looks simple. But then we use ultrasound, you can see all these frond-like loculations and so forth. So, again, the ultrasound gives much more prognostic information than the CT in terms of drainability. Here's another patient. Again, pneumonia has plural disease, I'll call it, at this site. It actually has some little micro abscesses in the lung, not micro abscesses, but small abscesses. And you can't tell what this, this plural fluid is. But if you look under ultrasound, it's solid. This is a fibrous peel here. This is actually one of those little abscesses that we see. Um, so this was in the solid state or grade three at, or stage three at this point. And another one of the same, again, pneumonia, plural disease, looks pretty simple based on the CT. Ultrasound shows it to be solid plural uh, peel. So bottom line with ultrasound is that it provides prognostic information. And unless it's really grade one, so there's no septations or anything, you need to give a fibrinolytic. If it's grade three, you can try it. Most will respond. You may have some failures, um, but again, it's much easier for a kid to get a small tube and have 24, 48, 72 hours of treatment to see if it works rather than go for a big surgery right away. And understand that you won't see all the plural disease because there's a small window using ultrasound and you have some inaccessible areas. But the good thing is that TPA really opens all those up pretty much anyway. So the technique we use, we, have a, we always sedate our patients right, unless they really don't need it. And pediatric patients don't need sedated for one of two reasons. Either they're teenagers and they can do really well and you can do it with local, or they have significant developmental delay and they don't move and so forth, so they don't really need sedated. Again, you're going to use local on um, those patients to make them comfortable while you do it. Um, but these patients typically have respiratory compromise, which is why we're doing the procedure. They have, you can decrease the cough reflex by giving the sedation and you have to give supplemental oxygen. So, you know, they're a little uh, on the shaky side in terms of clinical status sometimes. Positioning, you want to make the fluid dependent, but you're always sort of in a, stuck in this bind because, so you lay the patient supine so the fluid goes posterior, but then they're laying on their back. So when you're trying to drain fluid, it, it always goes dependently, so it's a little difficult to do it sometimes. But we, we prop them up and get to it that way. And then we always use ultrasound guidance for access. So it's real time, uh, it gives you multi-planar capabilities, and then you go right above the diaphragm, but you don't want to lay it on the diaphragm, the tube, because it can be painful. Um, we can use CT or fluoroscopy, but we don't usually. Uh, if you can't see it with ultrasound, you have to look for a different way. And then it's typical, the needle wire catheter type stuff. You want to go above the rib because the intercostal vessels are below the rib. You want to advance the needle subcutaneously. Uh, you want to point posteriorly, again, dependent. Um, we want to break up the loculation. Some people advocate doing that. Some people don't. I usually don't. Um, but you can use fluoroscopy to guide catheter placement if you need it. Here's a drawing showing the rib with the vein artery nerve underneath, and here's an ultrasound picture of the same thing. Here's the rib, and here's the blood vessel. So we don't want to go here. We want to go here. Again, a picture. So we typically do this. We go over the rib and point posterior to lay our drain down up in this area. Again, when fluid breaks up and goes to be drained, it's going to go down to this area. So this is where we want our catheter. Very different than the pneumothorax where we want our catheter anterior. So we secure it to the patient. I usually use sutures. You can use uh, any kind of adhesive thing, and then we just put a dressing on it. We do not need Vaseline or Adaptic. They, when the surgeons do that and they open up the inner, inner uh, costal muscles and so forth, they have to do something to keep air from sucking in. So with our technique, that doesn't happen at all. You want to place the suction typically minus 20 centimeters of water. What about what kind of tubes? Well, pigtails work pretty well, just a standard pigtail catheter. Uh, typically 8 to 12 French. Eight, you know, if you're under a year, you get an 8. If you're over like 5 years, you can get a 12. And that shows how much room there is between the ribs. We do not need a big tube. Um, not the surgeons, a 24, 32, 36 French tube. We do not need those. Salt quick is a different type of tube. It sort of looks like a surgical tube, but it's smaller. Again, we use a 12 French, uh, but it goes in over a wire, and it's made by Cook. Not that I have stock in anything, but uh, that's another one you can use as well. Well, what about fibrinolytics? When we first started, we used urokinase because that was really what was on the market. And TPA was expensive back then. Um, but urokinase, before any of you guys knew, it was taken off the market because of concerns of infectious disease. It's now back, but we've never gone back to using urokinase. We tried some streptokinase. It was cheaper, but everyone always uh, worries about allergic reactions 
uh, to that medication, so we stopped using that. And then we started using TPA, our tissue plasminogen activator, and it's actually the cheapest. Uh, it comes in little two milligram or two uh, milligram bottles, vials that can be opened up. It's basically used for clearing catheters, but you can use the same thing for this. Um, so it's actually the cheapest that there is. There's no significant allergies. It works very well. And so we use TPA and nothing else at this point in time. Um, no systemic effects have ever been reported, reported for any agent. So although these are fibrinolytics and you're giving them in the plural space, the patients do not become coagulopathic. Okay, so they do not bleed um, systemically. So what about the dose we used? Early on we started with 5 milligrams and that was uh, taken from the adult literature, but we saw some significant plural bleeding with that. So we stopped doing that and we dropped down to 2. And that works really well. We give basically 2 milligrams to everybody. Um, and alternatively, some people give a weight-based thing at 0 0.1 milligrams per kilogram with 3 milligrams max, and that works fine as well. But again, you know, we usually just use the 2 milligrams. Now, most of the patients you're going to be taking care of are going to be between, are going to be from 2 to teenage years. And so this, we usually don't get the little babies. They don't get empyeme because they just don't get bacterial pneumonia. So it's pretty much, you know, from toddler age up, and so there's not that huge difference in size of the patient typically. We mix it in 20 milliliters of saline, then we inject it into the tube and clamp it for one hour. And everything you read says try to have the patient move around to distribute the medicine, but these kids are just going to sit in bed. They're miserable. They're not going to do anything, so uh, they're not going to move, so I don't even try to tell them to do that. Uh, after an hour, you hook it back to suction, and you repeat that every 8 to 12 hours. Um, so when you do this, when you see loculations and so forth, you have to start doing this immediately. You can't wait a day or so before you start this. And don't stop until you see a response. And so you may give one dose and may not do anything. You may give a second dose and may not do anything. You give a third dose, the next thing you know, you have a liter of fluid that's coming out within a few hours. Um, so don't stop until you see it works. Again, two milligrams works pretty well. Um, after you've broken up the, the pleural space, so the loculations are gone, but fluid is still coming out. So you've got to remember, you still have a pneumonia, so you're still going to have fluid. Um, you can switch to saline if bleeding occurs. Um, that's just basically to keep your catheter open. Uh, if it hurts when you inject it, you can drop it down to 10 milliliters instead of 20. Um, and then, again, I don't think it causes bronchopleural fistulas. I think that's a uh, result of having necrotizing pneumonia. Because some people thought in the beginning that TPA may give you BP fistulas, and that's just not true. So when are you successful? Well, when you see an improvement in the chest x-ray or ultrasound that shows that there's no residual pleural disease. There's no tube output or little tube output, and the patient's doing better. When that occurs, take the tube out, you're done. But what about failures? Well, I don't consider it a failure unless I've given them a good trial from two to three days, 48 to 72 hours. And it's a failure if you have pleural disease still present. So if you haven't cleared the pleural space, then that's a problem. Now, you, again, if you cleared the space but you have fluid coming, that's okay. That's successful treatment. But it's when you still have pleural disease you haven't been able to break up. And again, chest X-ray and ultrasound will help with that, although if your pleural space is clear and the patient's doing poorly, again, a CT scan can tell you if there's an abscess or not. Complications are rare hemorrhage. Again, the fluid almost always turns pink or a little red uh, from the tube, uh, but we don't worry about that. None of the patients have any drop of hematocrit or anything. What about a bronchopleural fistula? Well, we can almost always take care of it, as I said. You can put in another tube or reposition the tube. You can put a larger tube in if you need to get enough air out. You can have higher suction, which is usually the first thing we do is we go to minus 30 centimeters water suction. Uh, rarely you can do, you can actually go in through um, an endoscope, go with the pulmonologist and find the bronchus that has a hole in it and then plug it with glue. And so that's been done as well, very uncommonly, but it does happen, it can happen. Uh, and if all those fail, the patient can get that still. The one thing to remember is that while we take care of all these and VATS isn't done primarily, that, that doesn't mean VATS isn't valuable um, because those, VATS and image-guided drainage are really sort of complementary. Is that if we fail, VATS can work, and if so for some reason they have VATS in that field, we can fix it. Um, so they actually work together. So what do we currently um, – we might consider – they're all sent to us to begin with. We might consider sending the surgery if it's a solid peel – or if no significant fluid on ultrasound, or if there's a big abscess, a foreign body in there, which surgery has to take care of a congenital lesion, such as a bronchopulmonary foregut malformation, um, or again, if there's no significant fluid, uh, it might have to go to surgery and things. But we take care of all others, and they all come through us. Uh, so just with a few exceptions, they're all ours.
So how do we do it in real life is that we do an ultrasound to prove there's fluid. Now, usually we're busy when they call us, so we say go get an ultrasound. Um, if we're not or we can get them right in, we'll do an ultrasound before, right as part of sort of the procedure. But we try to get the ultrasound first. Under sedation, we put in the drain. We start TPA immediately if there's any septation. And then after three to five doses, which is going to be one and a half to two and a half days, we reassess. And we get a chest x-ray every day, but if we can't tell if there's fluid or not, we'll get an ultrasound to see. So, again, if there's residual fluid, we keep TPA going. And if that doesn't work, we go to surgery. Um, but if there's no residual fluid, then we just follow the output and pull the tube when we're able to. So let's change a little bit and talk about some pulmonary abscesses. Um, indications are few. Most of these patients do very, very well with long-term antibiotics. Most of these patients aren't that ill, which is actually sort of interesting. Um, but if the antibiotics aren't working, we'll drain them. Or if symptoms are too severe to wait. And what that usually means is that they can't leave the hospital. Either they're on oxygen or they're febrile and they're too sick to leave the hospital. And then they'll ask us to intervene. Um, sometimes we'll do it just for an aspiration to see what the bug is. So we'll do that for that reason as well. So here's a chest x-ray. We can see this collection here. We can see some air within it. Uh, it consists of with an abscess. The patient gets a CT scan. And we see the fluid here with air up here. And this is actually one thing that can be difficult with abscesses is that when you try to stick them, you're always looking through air. You can see if we flip this patient on the back, the air would go up here, and it would be really difficult to see with ultrasound. Um, this case was done with CT for that very reason. You see a drain was put in there, the thing is collapsed, and the patient is going to do better. Uh, so that's how we did it there. Um, what about biopsies? Uh, we do biopsies for a variety of reasons. We uh, do pulmonary biopsies. We can do a core biopsy, a fine needle aspirate, or a needle localization. And needle localizations, we can use a wire or a coil in there. Plus, we usually inject some blood, and sometimes we inject some dye. And that's so the surgeons, when they go in, they can find it. And I'll show you a case of that. Uh, mediastinal biopsies, we do as well. Uh, they prefer us to do it than to go in doing a uh, uh, VATS or other thing. And uh, guidance, typically, we use CT or ultrasound, depending on where it is and what we need to see. So this is a crazy case that was just like last month. And you can see I had a chest x-ray, I had a whole socked in lung here. The whole thing's white, we had the heart being pushed to the left. And this was actually called a pneumonia originally. And they did an ultrasound and they saw stuff in there, they didn't think that was quite a pneumonia, so they ended up getting a CT scan. And in the CT scan, we can see there is fluid out here, but there's also solid components, some of which have fat and some of which have calcium. Um, so unfortunately, I, we were concerned this was going to be a mediastinal uh, germ cell tumor, malignant germ cell tumor. So uh, they sent it to me, and I drained the fluid off, and then you can see parts of this here, the cysts and stuff in there, in there. but this is a needle. So I put a guiding needle in and just took a bunch of biopsies. Now, typically, on this, we can use like a 16 or a 15-gauge guide, and then we put a 16-gauge biopsy needle, and we can take anywhere from 1, 2, 5, 7, 10 biopsies, and we, and we tend to take a lot. Um, and uh, the good thing on her was that this is actually a benign tumor. So it was a benign teratoma, which was nice for her because her outcome will be much better. Um, here is an osteogenic sarcoma patient, and you see his little nodule here. The surgeons wanted to take that out. Um, so we've gone in. This is a Hawkins localization needle. That's through it. And also you can see we've injected some blood and stuff into that. So when they go into the pleural space, they can actually see where that blood is. It makes it much easier to find than just the needle. Because um, no matter how well you try with these needles, a lot of times they end up getting pulled out when the surgeons drop the lung intraoperatively. So um, that's one reason some people use coils. So they coil, they put a coil in here and they leave a little tail lid hanging out so that it, can, it falls away and they can find it better. Another patient here, we can see a huge mediastinal mass. This is a scalp film. And you can see here, big mediastinal mass that they've asked us to biopsy. They do not like taking these patients to the operating room because when they do, uh, there's a risk of death associated with anesthesia. Um, and obviously you can't crack the chest or anything with just sedation, but we can biopsy them. Um, and typically you think CT would be the best way for this, but, you know, we really like using ultrasound in kids. Again, no radiation. Um, but you get to see what you're doing all the time, unlike CT, where you put a needle in, you take a piece, you, you know, you're looking here and there, but you're not looking all the time. Um, and it's really amazing the way some of these anterior mediastinal masses come up against the anterior chest wall. Uh, and because of that, we have a nice access 
you know, to use ultrasound. The things you have to worry about are the internal mammary arteries, of course, and of course you don't want to hit any of these big white things either. Um, but we can look at when we do those. And you see here's the mass. I'm coming in. This is a biopsy I'm taking right of that mass. Took a bunch of them. Um, and then you see here I've injected at the end gel foam, which is filling up all this tract so the patient doesn't have any bleeding. And this is a lymphoma in this patient. So we got good tissue. We got everything they needed for the diagnosis, so the patient did need it to have the chest open. Here's a little crazier case that actually one of my partners did. Um, you can see this patient had this lesion right here. was unknown, had adenopathy, didn't know why. And so wanted us to go after that. They didn't want to go in and do, you know, any kind of thoracoscopic stuff. Um, so we put a little needle in and introduced a pneumothorax into the patient. And here's the lesion right here. And then having a the pneumothorax, we went and go ahead and did biopsy of this region right here. I ended up being histoplasmosis. Uh, and then with that needle we had in, we brought the lung back up before we were finished. So, so we created a pneumothorax, we created a window to the biopsy, and then we brought the, the lung back up. And so the patient did very well, and we got our diagnosis. This patient has chronic granulomatous disease, and so we're worried about an infection. And had, had surgery here, you can see that there's surgical staples and so forth, but there was this new lesion here. Um, so we use CT, obviously ultrasound isn't going to be able to let us see. Sometimes with nodules, they're right up against the portal station. You can actually see them very well with ultrasound, and that was written up by Peter Chait about a decade ago. Um, but it had this lesion here, so go directly into it. And then afterwards, you'd actually see that this is this is a biopsy we did. This wasn't a needle load, because it's actually some hemorrhage around the site. The patient did fine and didn't have any problems, but there was actually some hemorrhage around the site at this place. Another patient, this patient has neuroblastoma. Um, you can see there's this chest wall mass, and, you know, it could look like infection and so forth, but if you look under the bone with it, you can see that the bones are actually being destroyed. Um, so we thought this was a recurrence of the tumor. So we did a biopsy with right inside stuff, the pleural disease, and this is ultrasound guided, obviously, and this is our needle coming in. Um, so we could do that, and it worked well. Again, here's another case. This patient has osteogenic sarcoma called the proximal tibia. Had a lung lesion that we did. Under CT, we put a needle into it directly and get the biopsy out. So in conclusion, uh, IR techniques help in the treatment of patients with pleural disease, and, and we are the predominant primary treatment for pleural disease as it is now. So all the pneumonia patients come to us. Uh, lung abscess drainage is feasible and useful, but not usually necessary. Um, but when it is, we do it as well. Uh, and again, mediastinal and pulmonary biopsies are, are successful as well. I, sh I should go one thing about lung abscesses. If they're really big and, like I say, a congenital lesion, that will drain them before they go to the operation, uh, operating room. So if they need surgery because they have a big congenital lesion they need to come out, we'll end up draining those first because it's been anecdotally reported that, you know, if your right lung is bad, when they, you go to the operating room, they put your right lung up. So they put your left lung down because they have to operate on it. And when they do that, sometimes all that pus that's in an abscess can come out of the abscess into the bronchus and go all the way to pollute all the left lung. And so patients have actually died from this massive, basically, spewing of pus all through the bronchial tree. Um, so before they operate for any of those, we drain those as well. So that's another indication for drainage. Uh, I think that's what I have. So open for questions. Thanks very much, uh, Dr. Hogan. That was a very interesting and uh, thorough talk. Um, I have a couple of questions here. Uh, the first one is uh, for me. Um, I just have a question about who, who does the ultrasound studies uh, when in your department? Is the ultrasound are the ultrasound techs trained to really evaluate these effusions, or do you just do the do them before the uh, per, uh, potential procedure? Uh, we usually get the ultrasound techs to do it. I mean, they're fine. They can take images, and people uh, people are good at that. Um, so. You know, if we're busy and we can't get it right away or something and we want the information quicker, you know, we have ultrasound do it. So, you know, we go check up on it later. Right. I guess it's uh, highly institution dependent, I guess. Whoever has more practice with it will be more comfortable doing it. Um, the other question I have uh, from one of our participants, uh, he wants to know um, about the use of TPA in uh, patients who are known uh, coagulopaths. Do you give them, you know, FFP and or platelets beforehand? Do you refer them to surgery? How do you manage those patients? Well, I've never had to deal with the, you know, I've done hundreds of these and I've never had a patient who's coagulopathic. Okay. So, you know, th these are, these are different than adults. Um, cause these kids are, these are community acquired pneumonias. 
Uh, whereas adults, when they have empyema as an abscesses and all that stuff, they tend to be, you know, debilitated people, institutional, um, you know, bound patients. And so they, it's just a whole different patient population. Almost these kids are all very well, and they have a community acquired pneumonia that, you know, does this to them. So it's it just we don't see that that connection between those groups of patients. Okay. Along those lines, do you get uh, pre-procedural labs routinely, or just uh, go what they got? No, you know, in, in, in pediatrics as a whole, we we don't bother getting pre-procedural labs unless we're doing a, a biopsy. We do, um, but just for drainages and so forth, we never get labs beforehand. We we look to see if they're there, so we know, but we don't ask for them. Okay, um, thanks. One other question um, in regards to simple effusion, uh, you mentioned earlier that uh, you know sometimes these patients will uh, just get multiple taps instead of having a tube in. Uh, but what do you do in your practice? Do you do you do multiple tasks, or do you just say to the treating physician, "Hey, it'll be better if we just put a small tube in and we'll let it be"? Yeah, they, they leave it up to us, um, so they don't have a problem with it one way or the other. Sometimes I'll just drain them. Uh, the only patients I will I will do a thoracentesis on and not put a tube on are the kids who have like almost no symptoms, and they just need a bug and they don't have one. Okay. So if that that kind of patient, then I'll just tap and take the fluid off because. I wouldn't be tapping them for symptoms anyway, so I'm just doing it for for a bug. I, I will take all the fluid off, though, so I don't like only take you know 10 nls and leave the rest. I, I drain them dry. Mm -hmm. um, but we're, again, we're not doing it for symptomatology. We're doing it for a diagnosis. Okay, so if they are symptomatic, then they get a tube regardless of uh, absolutely. absolutely. Okay, uh, there's all the questions that I have here. Um, uh, I'd like to just open up the questions, perhaps people who are on the phone who may not. Uh, be able to type messages to me. Does anybody have any questions? I guess there are no questions. Uh, okay, so Dr. Hogan, thank you very much again. It was very informative. Uh, for all the participants, we should have a uh, recording of this up on the SIR website at some point. Emails will go out notifying you of where you can find a repository of all the lectures. Um, this is the first of three pediatric-oriented IR lectures. We are going to have uh, one next month on uh, hypertension in the pediatric patient. It's going to be in the beginning of March. Uh, emails will go out for that as well. And we have a uh, talk on uh, vascular malformations, which is going to be given uh, just after SIR conference, uh, so in a couple of months from now. So be posted for that. Uh, any last questions, comments? Okay. Thanks again, Dr. Hogan. We really appreciate your talk. You're welcome.